Greetings and Happy New Year. As the President Dean of Turner Theological Seminary, I want to take this moment to invite our alumni and entire AME Church Connection to join us for a virtual celebration of the 127th Founders Observance of the Turner Theological Seminary scheduled for February the 1st and 2nd. You will be blessed with impactful preaching and teaching by Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green Sr., presiding prelate, 7th Episcopal District. This seminary is the intersection where race, religion, economics, politics, theology, history, language, culture, and the critical interrogation of what we think about God are brought together in a way that is both intersectional and utilitarian. And Reginald T. Jackson, presiding prelate of the 6th Episcopal District. The evangelical right also call themselves evangelical Christians. And my argument with them is I have no problem with you calling yourselves evangelical. But I have a problem with you calling yourselves Christian. Because my brother, my sisters, when you look at them, too many of them, they tell the king what the king wants to hear, not what the king needs to hear. The man and Dr. Dennis C. Dickerson, retired general officer, who will give our Henry McNeil Turner Heritage Lecture. I promise that you will be blessed and inspired by the preaching and teaching so register today and thank you in advance for your support of Turner Theological Seminary 127 Founders Observance. Good evening, and welcome to the Turner Theological Seminary Alumni Forum. Sitting at their feet, women, leading women in African Methodism. And to Bishop Jackson, the chairman of the Board of Trustees of Turner Theological Seminary, to our president, Dean Green, to Reverend Matthew Williams, the president of ITC, and to the officers and members of the Turner Alumni, to our honorees this year and future alumni, to our faculty, staff, and friends. It is my esteemed pleasure to begin our celebration of the 127th Founders Day celebration of Turner Theological Seminary of the Interdenominational Theological Center. I'm the Reverend Dr. J.S. Haithko Sr., president of the Turner Alumni Association. And tonight, we are blessed to have with us three leading women in African Methodism as we sit at their feet. We are pleased to have with us Dr. Carolyn McCrary, Dr. Jackie Grant Collier, and Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. And our moderator this evening will be the Reverend Tishara Void. But before we proceed to our panel, I wanna ask the Reverend Curry Butler if he would lead us in prayer this evening and the Reverend Oria Parker to read our scripture for tonight. Reverend Butler, you're muted. We can't hear you, sir. Bless your bones. Let us pray. Again. <laughs> the Father God, Lord, we come thank you once again for all you've done for us, for all the ways you made for us, all the, 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 the times you provided for us, God, for walking with us and being by our side. We come thanking you, Lord, for the legacy of our founder and for um, uh, Reverend Henry McNeil Turner, God, uh, uh, the school's namesake. But we also come, God, thanking you for um, Dr. Collier, Grant Grant Collier, and Dr. McQuarrie, and God, Dr. Teresa Fry Brown on tonight, God. 
We thank you, Lord, for the legacy that they've um, they've paved for us, Lord. And tonight we come to sit at their feet, God. So open up our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear that what you have for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, this evening, our uh, scripture comes from Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verse 7, the New Revised Standard Version. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. And now at this time, let us welcome the Reverend Tishar Void, our moderator for tonight. In celebration of the 127th Founders Observance, the Turner Theological Seminary alumni presents Sitting at Their Feet, Leading Women in African Methodism. Tonight, tonight you will be blessed by the phenomenal ministries of the Reverend Dr. Teresa L. Fry Brown, who is the Bandy Professor of Preaching at the Canada School of Theology. You will also be blessed by the phenomenal ministry of the Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Grant, who is the Fuller E. Calloway Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at the Interdenominational Theological Center. And in great concert, you will be blessed by the ministry of the Reverend Dr. Carolyn A.L. McCrary, who is the Jarena Lee Professor of Pastoral Theology, Care, and Counseling at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Not only are these phenomenal women of African Methodism, but they also contribute and are founders of the great change and impact that comes through womanist theology. Tonight, you are going to have an experience that is going to enhance your life. I want you to love, like, share the broadcast, start a watch party, invite somebody to come in with you and absorb the great wisdom that you're going to receive tonight. For more information on the continuation of this great conference, this 127th Founders Observance, visit the website turnerseminary.org. That's right, turnerseminary.org. I want you to consider giving tonight. When you go to the website, click on the Give button to support the work and give in the name and nature of these phenomenal women who are going to share with you more excellently about what God has made them in their generation. Enjoy the broadcast and get ready to sit at their feet. Good evening and welcome to the 127th Founders Day celebration. We welcome all of the alumni, friends, and students of Turner Theological Seminary who are here with us to just sit at the feet of these three wonderful women who have paved the way for so many who have come after them. I have the pleasure of moderating this conversation and I, I think it not robbery that we take this time to really sit and spend with them and to learn how they overcame so many struggles as they navigated the ministry in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, as well as finding and identifying their own unique voices. So we will start with our Lifetime Achievement Awardee, Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. And I'm gonna ask this question to all three of you. Um, can you tell us about your ministry struggles, what challenges you face being a woman in ministry, especially in a predominantly male-led denomination? How much time do we have? Ah, uh, <laughs> right. Um, I think that uh, this is this is my 39th year in ordained ministry. And I think initially because where I was located, there were no other women uh, at the church where I was. And so I became this enigma. And there was only one other woman in the entire conference that was going for local orders. And so I think initially it was just the newness in that particular area in Colorado about uh, what it meant to have a woman do what was traditionally there, a men's job. Uh, it was about people, men and women in the church, not talking to me, calling me names, saying that I wasn't really called, saying that I must have answered my husband's call. Um, being required to go to school, which I love education anyway, but was told that the men in my class didn't have to go to school because they had families to support. 
Um, so it was things like being told to stand on the floor and preach when I visited other churches. And the last time I did that was in 2000 when I had to stand at the foot of my mother's casket to do her eulogy because I wasn't allowed in the pulpit still. So some of these things are perennial. Some of the things are perennial. Um, I think at the idea, my grandmother used to say you have to be twice as good to be think half as good. It's still that kind of disproportionate I have to prove that I'm someone by degrees where people would rather call me Dr. Fry Brown than Reverend Fry Brown, even today. And so that's been some of the struggles, I guess, uh, along with persons who thought that the best way for me to advance would be to give up my integrity and my body. And once I refuse to do that, you have consequences for doing things your way. So I'll leave that there. So I'm think. That's just little things, but there's been so many good things, but those are some of the things that in some, in some cases still happen. In some cases still happen. And so how did you overcome some of those challenges that you faced? Like, what did you, what steps did you take? What did you do? Who did you talk to? Uh, some things come by prayer and fasting, but I think, <laughs> I think also I was very fortunate in that uh, my father in ministry, Jesse Boyd uh, brought Carolyn Tyler Guidry in to talk with me. Uh, when I was able to later travel the church, I talked to Dr. Grant. Uh, there were some men in my life that were very supportive. There were some older women who were in two camps, those that were frustrated because they were not allowed in ministry and those that did everything to make sure that I could do what I needed to do in ministry. And so it was a community, I believe in communal kind of things. So it was a community that helped me through. Other than that, it was a lot of prayer and cursing I just want you to cussing. I just, yeah, <laughs> a lot of prayer and cussing. And, <laughs> and, and that, uh, my faith that God called me, regardless of what other people said, was what brought me to the part that I am right now. Yeah. So prayer, fasting, cussing, and then yes. having a community of advocates around you to stand in your seat. Exactly. <laughs> and so our two Turner alums, Reverend Dr. Carolyn McCrary and Reverend Dr. Grant Collier, the same question to you. Uh, we will start with you, Dr. McCrary, and then go to you, Dr. Grant. Hello there. Good to see my sisters and my brothers. Uh, I'm hoping you all are here. Okay. I'm still hearing a lot of reverberation. So I'll kind of act like it's not there. Um, when, when, I, when I first contemplate, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. Uh, talking privately is easier than speaking publicly. Um, there is the kind of uh, hesitancy and anxiety, uh, too much self-exposure, but just enough to maybe be helpful. I I, I reflect on the Khan um, concept of Sankofa, which talks about not being ashamed to go back and fetch those things which are important and bringing them with you that proverbial saying, hope her lies into the country with her head turned backwards and some say plucking an egg from her tail feather. So I don't want to take a whole lot of time because we don't have a lot of time and, and I really want to hear more than I want to talk and I really want to hear other questions as well. <laughs> Dr. T, you reminded me how many years I've been in the ministry now? <laughs> So my my, my was forty seven years ago, mm -hmm. and I can clearly remember that at that time it wasn't so much male domination at first, and and to make it a very quick statement, it was not internalized male domination. Because well, number one, I was like, oh God, not. I know this is not some kind of calling. I've been working in the church all my life. This is not right. Uh, pulpit? No. Me? Oh, and then it came me, a woman? Oh, my God. Oh, me, a, a woman getting a divorce? 
I'm broken and not knowing which what. I I guess I'm just kind of losing it all together. The other thing is I did not know any other women in the ministry mm -hmm. in Macon, Georgia, in the Pittsburgh River, in Fort Hill, East Macon, or Camp Hope, where I eventually moved when I was seven. Didn't know any women in the ministry. I won't go into too much detail about that, but in this reflection, kind of this St. Hotham reflection, I said to myself, wait a minute. There were women in the ministry. They just were not ordained women in the ministry. So when when I think back about uh, Miss uh, Miss Shirney, happy to be seeing me live next door to the Sunday school. When I when I think about the Sunday school teachers at Great Chapel Avenue Church, and then at Campbell Avenue Church, I think about Lord, the next sister, I think, and you see about somebody else, sister and brother Annie and Nathaniel L. Cooper. These were women who were in the ministry and who did a lot of ministerial things, but who weren't in those leadership positions, quote unquote. Um, I want to highlight the fact we talk about intersectionality. I remember Louise Reed, and, and she was always critiquing issues about women and churches and church women united. And I'm like, what is that? And and she was critiquing racism and white supremacy. Even then, uh, Sister Louise Reed was look at the Bible, you all. Look at Solomon. She says, I'm black and beautiful. Okay, so. So I'm a little girl. As I reflect, there were women. But I do want to say that one particular struggle, when I said, okay, God, I'll see. I must be, I may as well go all the way. <laughs> uh, and processing through my ordination, I was up under, let's say, three bishops at one time. Then quickly stated, uh, one bishop, let's just say, was hesitant. Um, another one was helpful because he asked me, Carolyn, how can we help you? Wow. And that was in my doctoral process. And then there was another in the nation, not mine, told this poor oh, well. Well, you know you're going to have it because there are men who need this. And like Dr. T was saying, we have families. Um, and, and and it was as if, you know, this is a reality now. And I just want to remind you of this. And so this is how it is. And this is how it's going to be. And the way that it was said, I couldn't believe it to the whole floor of the church. So, Thank God there have been people who have really helped and ushered bishops, presiding elders, pastors. My pastor could not have been more, more uh, supportive. So there have been a number of things. I think I want to stop kind of because if I go on, I'll, I'll talk too much here at the beginning. And I want to honor all my time. So other things will come up. I, I appreciate that. And one I heard is the same thing that I heard with Dr. Fry Brown is that advocacy that you face some resistance as well. But there were those who stood up and said that they were going to help you along the way to help you navigate that journey. And so we're going to come back to that because I believe that's a, an important part of, of anyone's journey is having someone be able to walk with them and to journey with them and even to open those doors for them. Uh, Dr. Grant, tell us about your ministry challenges and struggles that you face. Uh, thank you uh, so much. It's uh, good to be here on the panel with my uh, dear sisters, Reverend Dr. Teresa and Reverend Dr. Carolyn. Um, well, the best thing I can say is that I have been in the church all of my life, the daughter of an AME pastor um, of 39 years. He pastored for 39 years. Um, I... Um, uh, was in the church all of my life and 
um, had a close relationship with him in that I was um, um, also uh, the uh, musician at um, uh, three of, of his charges. Uh, and so um, I was there with him even when my sisters and brothers on those Sundays um, had an opportunity to stay home and do what um, young folks want to do. Um, I could not do that because I was in the Ministry of Music at that time. Um, uh, so I've been in uh, the church and very involved and active in the church since um, um, really elementary school, um, starting um, um, engaging in leadership work. Um, even back then, president of the um, Junior Missionary Society, uh, president of the Junior Usher Board and all those kinds of um, of experiences, um, Sunday school teacher, and then seventh grade uh, uh, organist um, in my home church, and uh, then um, in eighth grade started going with my daddy, uh, being organist with his choir uh, in uh, um, South Carolina. Um, and when I uh, went to college, I had been in college, Greensboro, North Carolina, was still involved um, in the in ministry in the educational context. Um, I um, founded an organization called SC, uh, SC Students for Christian Social Concerns. Um, and um, we were able to get um, Bennett Bells, what we were called, what we are called, uh, to be involved in the ministry, um, uh, not in the church, but in the community. Uh, and we had a variety of uh, ministries uh, there. It was at that point that I felt the call to um, um, ministry uh, in, 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 as a profession. Uh, and so it was then that I um, uh, came to Turner uh, to be um, trained for, uh, to um, live out my professional calling. It was in that context, uh, for the first time, I um, experienced um, negative um, uh, attitudes regarding women in ministry. I had not um, grown up with that. At least I was not aware of it. I'm sure uh, it existed in my community, but I was not aware of it then. Um, I, um, uh, I do remember uh, one of the major evangelists uh, in the community was a uh, woman uh, evangelist, um, not in the Amy context, but in uh, one of the um, Pentecostal uh, traditions. Um, and she was very well uh, respected uh, by all, but there were problems um, in other contexts. I remember finding out later uh, in my life that one of um, the women uh, seeking ordination in the Amy tradition uh, was um, um, given a hard time. She was experiencing a lot of struggles in that movement. Uh, in her in her movement, uh, and um, I became aware that he was very helpful in supporting her and moving through her uh, process. She later uh, moved to New York and became uh, a presiding elder uh, in that context. Um, but my ministry, um, at, while in seminary, I experienced um, a lot of challenges, um, and so it was um, it was um, my first. Um, Experiencing of that real negative um, attitudes of my brothers um, in the preparing for the ministry. Um, I remember one student that we were in the library um, and um, studying, and um, uh, he said to me, Jackie, you know, the, the problem, you know, I, I like you, but the problem I have with you is that you're in the ministry and you want to take my job. And um, my response to him was, well, I don't want your job. You know, I, I uh, I'm, don't feel that call to the pastoring ministry. I feel the call to the, uh, to the ministry of education. Uh, but I do feel that those women who are called to the ministry, who are called to the pastoring ministry, you know, they ought to be able to get those pastoring positions. Um, and not be uh, discriminated against because of their gender. Now, I don't want your pastoring position, but 
there are women who are called to that ministry and if they are more qualified then they should have that pastoring uh position um well um uh, my experience is the interesting thing is even as i left um uh, Turner Seminary, uh, and uh, on my way headed uh, to the Union Theological Seminary to study uh, with um, Reverend Dr. James Cohn, I remember um, being in the registrar's office, turning in our caps and gown after graduation, and um, one of my brothers uh, said, asked me, what are you doing uh, when you leave here? I said, I'm going to Union Seminary to do a PhD in systematic theology. The first thing he said to me, well, you're not going to get married then, huh? You're not going to have a family. I said, well, I hope so. Why? Why? Why do you say that? Um, it's interesting then I began to experience, you know, another level of uh, resistance of women's ministry, women's capacity to, uh, to, to practice their ministry and be whole persons. Um, women are not allowed to be whole persons as men are allowed to be whole persons, which brings to mind um, one experience one experience that women have in, in, in as you said, used to have back in the day. At least I hope it's used to be have used to have, and I hope it's only back in the day. Um, but interestingly, one of the questions that women, women would get uh, when they uh, come to the conference floor. Um, um, in the you know the board of examiners report. One of the questions women would get what uh, was, "What does your husband think about your being in the ministry?" And every time I heard that question, it was just so irritating. Um, you know, not that it's a bad question. It's not a bad question. Uh, the, the problematic with the question is that you limit the question to women. You know, the question would be fine if you ask everybody uh, because you ought to be asking the brothers. You ought to be asking the men, what does your wife think about your being in the ministry? But the assumption is, the patriarchal assumption is that it don't, they don't know matter. Excuse me, you know, you know, excuse me, English, but um, it does not matter what your wife thinks. If you are called to the ministry, if you are doing what God calls you to do, then it does not matter what she says. It does not matter what she thinks. That's the sexist nature of the situation. Because it should be a question that you ask everybody and not just a question that you ask women because you live in a patriarchal society, you live in a patriarchal church, which says that it does not matter what women think. It does not matter what's uh, appropriate for women, it does not matter. And so uh, what you are concerned about is only, um, you know, what men think, because men define the world and men define the church. Um, well, my struggles, uh, I, I'm, I, it's getting kind of long, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna cut, cut it, but what, what are the things I, I, I've uh, done in my ministry to try to challenge all of what I was experiencing since seminary, not prior to seminary, but since seminary, uh, while in seminary and since seminary, uh, is to um, develop advocacy ministries uh, that indeed um, challenge uh, the patriarchal systems and the um, gender oppression that women experience in the church. And so it was um, in uh, 1976, uh, when I, uh, when the annual general conference was here in Atlanta, and um, I um, called uh, the women in ministry together uh, to do some organizing. I uh, prior to that, I had I been on a, a position paper committee uh, where we produced um, a position on position papers on issues of the day, um, capital punishment. Um, uh, uh, reproductive rights, um, you know, a variety of, uh, uh, of issues. And I did a position paper on women. Uh, and it was entitled The Status of Women in the Amy Church. And, and um, I, I um, raised issues uh, about um, the situation of women in the church 
and when women uh, decide to uh, uh, receive the call to preach and the problematics uh, that they experience uh, in their um, uh, desire to fulfill their uh, call. Um, and that position paper was presented to, uh, well, the recommendations were presented to the General Conference in 76. But at the General Conference, I also brought together the women, women in ministry and that, um, that group, um, that was the first time that we met as a group, and um, over the years, uh, it developed into what is now a Emmy Women, Women in Ministry, uh, and the advocacy work of that group led to also the development of the Commission on Women in Ministry. Um, and I would also say that the advocacy work of, the, of that group, also with the um, support of other organizations like the lay organization uh, and the missionaries, uh, missionary uh, society, uh, led to the um, uh, election of women uh, in as general officers and women as bishops, um, uh, beginning with Bashar McKenzie in, uh, in the year 2000. Um, it also led to the increase of women as pastors and uh, um, uh, as presiding elders uh, uh, as well. Um, but I would also say, even as we recognize the progress that we have made in the church, uh, the fact of the matter is we're still not there yet. Uh, you, you know, uh, two mantras uh, that I operate uh, by, one is more things change and more things remain the same. Um, and so there are still issues that we need to be dealing with that, that go, uh, go uh, you know, has a long history long and a long history. Um, and the other mantra I operate uh, by is um, we come a long way, but we've got a longer way to go because we still have to reach that point of liberation of uh, Black women and justice for Black women, even in the ministry. So there is a common theme that I hear throughout all of you ladies' stories. Um, it is one of resistance, but then there is also the sexism and the gender oppression that happens, but then there's the advocacy. There is the advocacy of others that stand in uh, that stand in with you. And then there's also carving your own spaces. Um, but then the one thing that, that I heard that happened with all three of you is this sense of fragmentation, where you are not allowed to show up as your whole self, where you have to either choose to be a woman or choose to be a preacher or choose to be black and choose to be a woman or choose to be a black woman, but not a black preacher. And so there are all these fragmentations that happen with women in ministry. And I've had the pleasure of sitting under the feet of all three of you women. So I have seen how you all show up as your whole selves and you show up with your authenticity of being you and all that God has created you to be. How did you get to that space of being authentically Dr. Teresa Fry Brown and being authentically the Reverend Dr. Carolyn McCrary and being authentically Dr. Jacqueline Grant? And I ask that because, well, Dr. McCrary, you've paved the way for pastoral care and Dr. Fry Brown, you've paved the way for preaching and teaching and 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 also Dr. Grant, you've paved the way in theology in systematic theology. How did you get to that point of identifying and claiming your voice and being who the creator has made you to be? <laughs> no, and don't everyone speak at once. <laughs> Do Dr. T says how how, how much time you have? <laughs> how, how, how? I'm not how. sure that. I'm not, I think it's still in process for me. Right. Uh, I, I think that that I would be dead if I wasn't still developing something. I, I think that years and critically important for me to uh, try to understand what, I am, what my gifts are and understand that not everybody's going to like me, nor do I seek that. And that in order for me to chart my own path, I had to look at who was before me. So I didn't stumble on the same path or run to the same glass that they did. I also had to I'd be cut every now and then. And there would be some isolation every now and then. There would be some names that still swirl around in my head sometime when I go to a pulpit from years and years ago that I have to pray that God muffles my appearance, that there were some people that I thought were going to be my supporters that became my enemies, not because I asked them to, but they decided that I was taking, as Dr. Grant said, they thought I was there to take their place. 
So I didn't trust a God that only had one space. I had to learn to trust a God that was big enough for everybody to be included somewhere. And, and so the voice that I have to develop in the church is a little different than the voice I had to develop in the academy. It's a little different than the voice I had to develop in the world. It's a little different than the voice I had to develop in my home. Because my first husband divorced me because I went into ministry. Then there were people that said that I was going to wind up, my child was going to wind up on the street. She was going to wind up pregnant. We were going to wind up poor. And so I had to listen to all the, uh, Dr. Carroll, all the ancestors that came through with me and preached out in the corners and on the roadside. And I thought I would be a wimp to try it myself. And so if someone in a pulpit, I could preach anyway, leave the ground as the ground. If someone said I wanted to work to an office because I didn't do what they told me to do, I had to trust God to provide for me to be there regardless of the distractors. And then to also keep my voice when when God helped me say so did something and the very people that tried to keep me out then claim that they helped me along the way and not turn around and I'm using my word again and cuss their behinds out, but to pray for them. I'm quiet, but I grew up in Missouri fighting and I grew up with boys, so I know how to do that. And 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 so it's that kind of thing. And so my voice is coming to a place where I don't come in with my head down, but I come in knowing that wherever I am, God made me to be there. And so some people have heard me say this before. I don't beg for a seat at the table. I understand when I enter the room, I can shift the atmosphere just by being who God made me. So I don't have to do it. I don't apologize for who I am. I don't apologize for where I work. I don't apologize for my dress. I don't apologize for what my voice sounds like. I don't apologize for my love. I just show up because I trust God that much. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that oh. Man, that was awesome. And especially the part where you said you don't beg for a seat at the table because, you know, just your presence will shift the atmosphere. That um, that type of, dare I say, boldness and confidence in who God has created you to be, that definitely comes with wisdom and years of just being at God's feet and, and listening to the ancestors and how God has spoken into you. So thank you very much for sharing that. Dr. McQuarrie? You're muted, Dr. McCrary. There you go. I'm okay. okay. I think he unmuted me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the essence of this was what did we do to, to, to navigate and overcome, even with all the I've, I've, I've gone through many. As Dr. T was talking to me, Dr. Grant, I, I want to focus on the one part. Where I'm going to first, is the question. This is actually, I went to my coming to seminary because I came to, interestingly enough, seminary. Uh, it was a convergence of life's challenges. And, and, and many people have heard that when I did come to the seminary, I was basically suicidal because a lot of two of my had fallen that I thought were wonderful. And I'll just say, uh, one was marriage, which I thought was good and holy and, and you need to stay in. And another one was education because I thought I was going for a certain trajectory. In, in my education, I was studying French African literature. And one of the one of the poems that I studied uh, in that in that genre of naked of, of being black in, in colonized countries in Africa. Um, by Bernard Dadier uh, wrote a poem, Je vous remercie de m'avoir créé moi. I was like, how in the world? Now we're talking about the 70s, you are. How in the world is somebody writing about? I thank you again, my God, for having created me black. So now I'm wrestling with my 
blackness. I'm wrestling with being a woman. I'm wrestling with being divorced. I'm wrestling with the shame of my family. Oh, I had the biggest, nicest wedding. I'm so glad I did pictures of relatives that have passed. Uh, but it was really traumatic. My my point is by the time my mama asked me the question, as I'm spiraling into what I know now was depression, she said, now what were you studying when you were up there at Brown in Rhode Island? I said, I was studying French African literature. She, she said, well, why don't you go back and study that some more? I said, well, mama, when I was studying, they told me that what I was asking questions about in this literature had to do with African theology. I said, oh my God, I think I studied in college in France and Africa. I visited there, but I didn't think about theology. I don't even know really what theology is. So my mama said, well, Carolyn, don't they have one of those theology schools up there in Atlanta? She read all the newspapers and notices and everything. She said, well, what's up there? You go up there and fight. Bill is going up there Monday. You go with him. Consequently, I ended up at the Interdenominational Theological Center, Turner Seminary. And it was actually the place nothing do to knew what i was talking about the french african literature and literature. dr thomas <laughs> that's lord have mercy carolyn you 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 are fine. and yes you have some struggles and let me listen to you and others as we are clock the, the real point that I want to make is that I was studying for my life. I was looking for a reason to continue. So in studying, studying, and studying, I ended up graduating at the top of my class. Not because that was situations, but I wanted to read everything that that was given to me. I wanted to study everything. I, I even asked um, one of our professors in church history, I said, well, what, what, what book with all the African history in it? And he told me, he said, well, you don't have it on the school, but you can go and look up in that one. I said, oh, Africa, the mother of major, major Western theology and philosophies. I had already encountered Czech Deonta Diop. So Africa being the mother of, of the cradle of civilization, because I needed that to come out the struggle to connect all of these parts of me. So so like Dr. T is saying, there, there are different, different parts. It was only at ITC that I was able to look at that part of me, look at that part of me by 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 time I was articulating and Dr. Grant had just looked though we had been at this college together. I knew to think <laughs> about the issues that women face. I was able to move from myself and my own which I've been working on all my life since then, all my internalizations. But let me look at the plight of women and others and children for that matter, and men for that matter. So just kind of jump forward and moving back and jumping forward. I was a womanist before I knew it. And, and the term has come to help me to have words to say, my God, white supremacy. Oh, it, look how it manifests way back then when they parcel up, even before that, when they colonized when they brought up the whole spiel. And then now, how it, let me, let me look at how male 
supremacy impacts me and other people. And 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 let me look at how marriages impact me. It 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 helped me my studies at ITC. And and I'm saying that deliberately because of the alumni occasion. It just, I, I will say in, in, in this part right here, you know, you all, I was a, a, a kind of challenging one in the positive. I, I was dumbfounded when I saw people who didn't want to read. I, I was like, really? <laughs> uh, even then, you paying money? Okay. I think to help some people at that time, I became a tutor and tutored in homiletic and then at that time, Old Testament, and had that kind of community of, of students together. So I, I became a, a TA of sorts, a tutor, as we call it, and I learned even more. I really, really want to learn something, teach it. Hmm. So, different parts. I mean, that, that's a little bit and piece. That's as, that's as much as I can say and kind of put a, put a little bit. But studying the world, my relationship to God, oh God, that takes way too much time. And my relationship to myself and to others gave me meaning and wanting to live. So in your quest and, in your journey and your hope for living to finding purpose, to being able to find that healing, you use your studies and that is actually your voice actually spoke before you actually reclaimed your voice. You, when you said that you were a womanist before you knew it, that means it, it was already in you when it came out of you, but it was your studies that helped you to give word to that. That is awesome. And it definitely helpful to someone who may be struggling even because we know even our, um, not our founder, but even uh, the Reverend Jarena Lee had that same type of story where she was really wrestling and really struggling. And it was really that communion with God. It was really that digging deep. It was really that going beyond and being able to find and follow that voice that allowed her to show up. And so Dr. McQuarrie, we thank you for that, uh, for that nugget that's helping someone who is also struggling, helping someone to let them know that on their journey to healing, if they just keep studying, they just keep looking at the world and everything around them, they will find God, find themselves, find life, and find meaning. So thank you. Dr. Grant, how did you come to find and to embrace your call? Yeah, I think it's um, that very positive experience that I had um, in my home with the uh, Past the preacher father, um, and the support that I had um, when I um, went to college, uh, I worked in. The, I was able to start that Christian organization, SCSC. Um, I was able to start that because I worked in the uh, office of the chaplain, um, and he was very supportive of me and very supportive of, uh, of, um, of my, of my work. Um, um, I was about to tell you something funny about that, but, uh, I, but I won't. Um, uh, so I, I had this, the, the support of, um, people, uh, in my life when I, when I was growing up, um, even apart from going to church with daddy every, every, every Sunday, you know, it was, Going to the the Episcopal meetings in in Columbia at Allen University, um, and um, you know would be Daddy and a bunch of other preachers and me, um, and um, uh, so um, it um, I, I, I've always had the support um, uh, of, of trying to seminary, um, and so it enabled me to. Um, uh, develop in ways uh, that um, uh, perhaps um, others had not. Um, when I got to uh, seminary, uh, yeah, that also, even though I was experiencing some resistance, some struggles, 
uh, because of the attitudes of some brothers, some, some of the brethren, um, you know, I still, it still did not interfere with my sense of call. Um, uh, and, um, and so I was able to move through all, all, uh, of that also, um, Dr. Carol, Dr. Carol also graduating at the top of, 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 of my class, um, at, um, at ITC. Um, and then moving to the PhD program where I had the opportunity to study even more, uh, of, um, women, black women in, in, in particular, um, that led me uh, to the uh, development of um, a womanist theology, um, uh, finding all of these women that I was not, of whom I was not aware um, when I was studying uh, in seminary. Uh, I, I never studied any significant, I'd never studied any women uh, while I was in, in, in seminary, so uh, it, it, at, at the uh, master's level. Uh, so it was when I went to the PhD level that I began to um, study these uh, issues and as I was able to um, research um, Black women's experiences uh, as a source for doing theology, I, um, you know, I was introduced to feminist theology um, and, um, and, but I had not been uh, introduced to the experiences of Black women. And so that's really what got me into uh, that, uh, the process of, finding out who we are uh, and providing um, and insisting that our experiences uh, must be used uh, as a source for doing theology. And what that means then is that we must uh, do theology in, in more holistic ways uh, because yes, um, uh, black women uh, suffer from um, gender contradiction, uh, living with uh, uh, sexism, but um, that's, not, that's not all. That's not all of our reality. Um, uh, there's also uh, racism um, because uh, of our blackness and when you, uh, what one author called um, live in this double jeopardy situation, um, uh, you're black and you're female, uh, then that means that you're most often poor. And so that uh, we have to deal with issues of race, gender and uh, uh, class. Um, and um, it, uh, one uh, church woman says that, um, we not just live in, in experiences of double jeopardy, but it's triple jeopardy. Uh, as we black, we female, and we in the church. Um, and, and, and so, we, you know, researching all of this uh, experiences and, and how black women historically uh, have uh, challenged the, um, uh, the various kinds of um, isms that exist in our lives uh, then provided me with um, the strength that I needed uh, to do what I um, um, uh, began doing uh, in the, the mid seventies um, in the church in particular. Um, now, you know, the problem with that, it, well, it's not necessarily a problem, but the reality of that um, is that you don't always make friends. Uh, when you're raising issues and challenging structures uh, that existed not just years, not just decades, but centuries. Um, you're challenging institutions, you're challenging structures, and people have bought into those institutions and structures, and um, when you challenge them, you the, the structures you you challenge in the people uh, because it's the, they're so grounded in them, and so you know what that meant was that um, you know it wasn't always um, you know pretty, but 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 I, I the way I dealt with that um, is uh, even as I remember uh, those experiences we had in the church at general conferences and at um, Bishops' councils, um, uh, bishop councils um, uh, meetings. Um, uh, you, you know, I when we started women in ministry, we used to meet with the bishops um, uh, at the bishops' councils, uh, and then uh, we would um, do some things at the general conference. Um, and one of the things we had, I remember, we used to have what we called late night 
dialogue with the bishops. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is way back, in, you know, in the 70s. Um, uh, Dr. Three said I, I had not really thought about it. It hadn't uh, dawned on, on me. Uh, but in actuality, I've been in the ministry for 47 years, uh, too, uh, Dr. Carroll, uh, in terms of the ordained ministry. Uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, so but back in the 70s, um, you know, women were timid. Um, women were afraid uh, to ask these questions, to make demands, to um, challenge situations and institutions, et cetera. And so we uh, started having these uh, late night dialogues with, um, with with the bishops, and it, it really used to be late night. It would start like midnight, you know, or, or, and sometimes it start like ten, eleven, and and you know, go even a little past midnight. Um, but women weren't; um, they were kind of timid about raising questions. So I would moderate the sessions, and I would raise the questions, uh, and then I would um, you know have them to. Um, Write that question down, and you know, send them to me, and I, and I, and I would raise the question. Um, my rationale was, well, I really was not looking for any um, bishop to appoint me to a church. Um, so, um, you know, rather they get mad with me or not, you know, it really doesn't matter. Um, I understand the concern of the women, you know, if, who's who would say if I raise this question, he might get mad with me, and 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 I don't know what he'll do to me. Not sure. Okay. Amen. Um, so now, gave you so, space, able to use your voice. Come again. I said so. Not not desiring a pastor, it gave you that space to be able to use your voice because you didn't have the fear of repercussion. Yeah, yeah, that you know that was um, what was my was was my thought. But yeah, you know, I would like to think that even if I I, I did feel a call to the ministry, uh, that perhaps I do the same anyway. But uh, you know, but I don't know. Um, uh, but it was just my sense of uh, of call. You know, you know, God calls you to um, to the ministry, and yeah, that means that everybody's not gonna like you. You know, so it's not a it's not a Ministry of trying to get folks to like you, or trying to get disciples, or uh, you, you know, you, you know, some folks gonna like you, and some folks not gonna like you. Some folks gonna misinterpret what you're saying, and you know, because I'm, I've, I've never intended that any um, bishop would get mad with me. You know, uh, my my intention is just raise questions about what you're doing, raise questions about what you developed here, raise questions about how you impacting women's lives. Uh, you know, and just goes beyond just giving somebody a church. I, I, my position is I ought to be able to raise questions about what you're doing. Um, um, and um, so it, it, it was not done uh, in any disrespect. Uh, it, it, I, I, you know, I have great respect for all offices of the church. Um, you know, just like I have great respect for governmental political offices. You know, but when you, but when you develop the structures that um, that are oppressive of certain people because of, you know, something they cannot even control. I can't control my gender. I can't control my race. Uh, you know, um, then that's problematic. And so, you know, my position is you raise the question where questions need to be raised. And I, and I, and I, and I think I've been good at being respectful of people. Um, uh, though they may not interpret uh, the way I have um, uh, challenged uh, issues, principalities, and powers, um, they certainly were not uh, intended to be uh, disrespectful, but um, uh, intended to uh, try to get significant changes in the church and in the large society. Um, because indeed we are all God's children. Amen, I say to that. Yes, ma'am, I say to that, because as you said, as you challenge the system, you're not just challenging the system, you're challenging the people. And so that's gonna cause some backlash. That's gonna cause um, some people to be unhappy, but you gotta raise the questions. You gotta be able to ask them. 
So I do want to shift gears a little bit because we had a question that came in in the comment section. And so our one of our viewers would like to know, what is one thing about you that people would be surprised to know? What is one thing about you that people would be surprised to know? We know about Dr. Fry Brown, the teacher. We know about the academician. We know about the preacher. We know about Dr. McCrary, the pastoral care and the healing. We know about Dr. Grant and the systematic theology and the womanist theology. But what is one thing that people would be surprised to know? I'm sorry, my <laughs> that I was going to, oh. to go first again. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, my sister. Go right ahead. I'm still oh, thinking. No, no I, I, I like this. No, but I was probably the best gym in Camp Hope because I could climb the tallest trees. My brother and I'm I'm the first girl under three boys, so. Others who uh, uh, were boys, so over me, but he would have learned everything football, baseball, basketball, and rock fights. I used to attend rock, and it's the one that you ever get to live. But I also learned to climb trees, hmm. and there was this 50 foot pine tree in my yard, and I would go to the tip top of that tree and sit and, and and now that you all have pushed me to say this because um at the top of that tree i could see the church camp hope Emily church that was down the street and around the corner and i could see the little red schoolhouse that side it which was the land granted to that black community it, it was really a village reflecting on so much of how, how it was a village but and the reason I say I'm a gymnast, not only climbing, but I had the dis a dismount out of that tree that um uh what's my sister Biles' first name? Simone. Simone <laughs> dismount with the team in it off that last limb and go ta da. <laughs> So, but you know, it also speaks to economic disparities because I think had there been the kind of uh, economic support for our community and our schools. Oh, I'm you know, gymnastics. We played basketball on a concrete floor because the white people refused to put the, put the, put the hardwood over the concrete when they built Maggie Taylor Elementary and High School in Great Georgia. Dr. McCrary, the general, we could have been looking at you in the Olympics. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Dr. Grant, what is something about you that people would be surprising to know? I really have not thought of anything. Dr. Teresa, maybe while you talk, I might can think of something. I'm I'm thinking. I think because I think because about my life that people probably already know that I ran track with Dr. Carolyn. And because I grew up in a place, so I do all those things that were thought women couldn't do. But uh, I remember when I was 18, going to getting ready to go to college, my brother and my dad had me pull transmissions because they said I was too independent where I'd be by myself all the time. So I like to work on cars when that was what you could do. The only other thing I think, uh, people know I directed choirs, but um, I'm always surprised that people think that I can't cook because I'm a woman in ministry. And, and so when they, you know, it's like, oh, you can do those things. And I, I just think that's very funny. But uh, other than that, I love Jeopardy. I can't think of anything. I love games and procedural dramas and uh, wanted to go to law school. So ministry was not my first thing, it was law. But I was told I couldn't know. First was the translator, the media. I took German and Spanish and stuff like that. Then it was law school and I wound up 
God's saying it's time to go to seminary. And I would have been at the ITC, except I was going to a divorce and had a two-year-old and could not leave Denver. So I went to school in Denver. I just clear that up since everybody else is an alum. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, you did give me um, one uh, one um, idea, Dr. Teresa, and and that is this whole thing about cook, cooking. My set, my second, uh, my um, Atlanta church uh, is um, Flipper Temple AME Church. Um, I'm at Cosmopolitan AME now simply because my sister, uh, Pastor Debbie Deborah Grant, passes there. Uh, but my home church in Atlanta is Flipper Temple. Amy Church, and uh, I do recall the late Reverend Julius C. Williams um, um, I, uh, was uh, shocked one day when I uh, left church and I said to him, oh, I got to go home and cook. And he said, oh, oh you can cook. Mm -hmm. um, he, he could not believe that I could cook. Yes. You know, I mean, I don't cook, especially now I don't, but I can. Mm -hmm. And I did a good bit of it back then. Um, so that's one answer to your question. I couldn't think of any others. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. We have a gymnast. We have a track star, also a mechanic. We have uh, chefs on the line. Um, and then you both have mentioned uh, music. So what was your, was it voice? Did you play an instrument? What was it about music? Uh, who am I? Oh, wait, Dr. You, you, Dr. Grant, and you, uh, Dr. Pry Brown. Um, um, in seventh grade, I was the organ um, organist at my local church, which was right around the corner from from my home. Um, and in uh, at my father's church, I uh, uh, played, was a pianist. I played the piano uh, for uh, the choir. Uh, uh, my my minor in um, in at Bennett uh, College was music. Um, okay. Uh, my uh, my major was French. My minor was music, um, and there I studied uh, organ, great, gorgeous pipe organ, uh, at uh, Benedict Bene College uh, Chapel uh, back then, um, and had the opportunity to go do a field um, um, a trip to Duke University uh, to view their organ. They had a more massive. Uh, pipe uh, mm. organ, and I also um, studied uh, more of a uh, piano. Um, so um, no voice, just organ and piano for me. You, you said just organ and piano. That's a big deal. <laughs> That's a big, big deal. That's a big, big deal, Dr. Mm. Brown. So my mother was a musician. They didn't call it music when she was doing that, but she was a church musician. So I sang, direct choirs, and played clarinet. That's about it. <laughs> oh, I played the clarinet too. Look at that. <laughs> I, I played the clarinet starting in the sixth grade all the way through college. All uh, right. Oh, and the, pan, the piano was with ah. the, <coughs> uh, So let me ask. And you, I played. Uh, yes, ma'am. I played the French horn oh. in the high school band. All oh, right. wow. Yes. So it's just a, a musical yes. group here. <laughs> So, um, so we've talked about uh, some things that we don't know about you. We've talked about how you all have just charted the way. We've talked about the glass ceilings that you've had to break, the glass that you've had to walk and crawl through. Um, for those of us that are coming, this as we are called the new generation of leaders, uh, there's a buzzword that's being thrown out now, and it's prophetic. Uh, prophetic leaders and prophetic preachers and prophetic teachers and uh, I did have the pleasure of uh, sitting in class with Dr. Fry Brown for a prophetic preaching in the 21st century. And my question that I have for you all is a two-part question. The first being, what does being a prophetic preacher, teacher, um, being a prophet mean to you? And how does your work uh, play into that? So what does it mean to be a prophetic teacher, preacher, or prophet? And how does your work play? Um, play into that? And Dr. McQuarrie, we're going to start with you this time. We're going to let Dr. Uh, Brown uh, uh, break. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 uh. Prophet? Prophetic? 
interesting because we had this morning a serious discussion at one of our faculty council meetings. And, 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 and actually, we were discussing that term that we see now, uh, which has a lot of import, uh, prophetic problem solving or problem solving. But you didn't ask that question. Um, so I won't move too much into that problem say that, that that terminology is problematic for particularly the listening of pastoral care and counsel because we don't want to posture ourselves as those who come in to uh, to solve the problem, the whole question of rugged individualism. Uh, and 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 on the on the part of prophetic I'm 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 really gonna I'm really gonna think a, a little bit more uh there if I think of prophetic astral care because the point that I made was definition and 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 I and I what I'll say is I'm working on my definition of of prophetic and 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 I'll I'll say a little bit more. Um, it, 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 let me say something. I'm not even sure how it may tie in. This this woman keeps coming to me. <laughs> I, I I I I spoke as well as I could about not having roll models back. When I was younger, and I thought, as I was thinking about this evening, I said, you know what? But there was this who 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 called herself a prophet and a and a preacher, and I'll just call her Reverend B. But her behavior was challenging. She would walk down the street in the summertime wearing coats, sometimes fur coats. She would go to people's homes and challenge people who lived. She literally built brick structures on some land that wasn't hers. So when I was coming into the ministry, I said uh, many times, the only person I knew was Reverend B. And I was like, okay, that that, that may be me, or just didn't know what to do with her. But in the last literally 48 hours, I have, I have been really revisiting her. It was maybe last year when I found her, as, as I as I look back over my quote life in history and ministry, I, I asked my brother Butch, I said, what, what is Cousin B's family? I knew her name. I said, where did she come from? And, and Butch is like the, the griot in our family. He said, Carolyn, you remember? was uh, Mr. B's sister. Reverend B was the sister of Mr. B, who was the master brick in Macon. Actually was the brick mason that did the brick work of many of my father's general contractors for many of his houses and churches and, and classes. So, so to make this very short, and revisiting her now, which I have studied and learned, I wonder what trauma did she experience? And it has come to me that there were probably two great traumas. And 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 and, and the third one or first one may be that she was probably in some way used to violate one out of every three of us, some kind of violation, abuse, and or rape before we're 18. But that's 
kind of maybe a hypothesis. But the other two that are that are that are seemingly staring me in the face is that she was called to the ministry. But I can imagine if what I went through in 1973, what she must have gone through prior and been told what she could not do. And I'm clear that they said she laid those bricks, cement blocks even, so well that it took them great strength and effort to dismantle that structure. She probably could have been a master bricklayer, but here you have another profession where her family is renowned but her gender say you can't be that. You can't be that. So I want to bring her discussion and I I'm pondering and meditating a lot. Um, prophetic, I'm not sure. I'll stop. I thank you for your honesty. Um, and that that definition is still uh, being worked. And I even thank you for bringing her into this space as I think about you talking about her laying a brick that was so strong and laying a foundation and laying a structure that was so sound that it took for someone and in, in, in a great strength to come and to dismantle that. And that could be um, symbolic for a part of the prophetic of this tearing down of these strongholds, tearing down of these strong systems, um, that have been built. Um, and in some cases it could even be even building up a structure that is good enough for others to be able to stand on that someone can't just come and blow over. Um, so I thank you very much for bringing that into the space um, and allowing us to to share in that moment and in, in her personhood. Uh, Dr. Grant, we now bring the question to you. Well, the... Um... not um, trying to be uh, shamanic in any way, but um, one could say that um, prophetic teaching, being prophetic means constantly living and anyhow existence. Um, it may not be convenient for you to deal with these issues of gender, race, class, age, disability, sexuality, uh, whatever the ism is. It may not be convenient, but you got to do it anyhow. Prophetic e existence is, you know, it may not be popular to step out, but you got to do it anyhow. Prophetic. Being prophetic means that, you know, they, there may be folks who object to your talking about justice all the time, but you got to do it anyhow. Being prophetic means that, you know, folks are not going to like what you're saying how you're speaking all the time, but you got to do it anyhow. Being prophetic means that um, people may not like you, but you got to do it anyhow. Being prophetic means that 
you may suffer some consequences. But you got to do it anyhow. Being prophetic means that some folks may stop listening. But you got to do it anyhow. Being prophetic means that sometimes you might be alone. But you got to oh. do it anyhow. Yeah. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as a mighty flowing stream. Being prophetic is an anyhow excuse. Thank you very much, Dr. Grant. He summed up prophetic in three words, do it anyhow. Dr. Fry Brown, the question now comes to you. <laughs> so I taught this class this afternoon on prophetic preaching. Uh, <laughs> so I start out by talking about as you know, Hurston saying there are years that ask questions and those that answer. And I think that the prophetic is misunderstood as always talking against something instead of addressing the totality of it. risky behavior. It is having a tentative God in the people. So it's never individual. And prophets die. So one doesn't get prophetic or call themselves prophetic just because they want power. Prophets die. They are left alone. They uh, have to love the people who want everybody to be saved, for everybody to live. And and this contemporary people say, I'm a prophet. What? Or we even talk about, about who really hears from God. And who can say what I have is what God put in me. And um, it is very it is very lonely. And if you look at biblical as well as as well as people today that all look at their lives. As as Dr. Grant said, people don't like it. People don't understand what they mean. And I think we hear to people when something happens. If you don't say this this week, you shouldn't be there. You don't know what God has told them and how they're looking at things. And it's never one item that we talk about. Everything we say is interconnected. So if what I need to talk about happens to be um, sexism, and someone else has to talk about classism, and someone else has to talk about children, that does not mean that somebody's not or somebody's not prophetic because all of those interact together. And I think that we rush too quickly to say I'm a prophet and don't count up the cost. So when Dr. Grant said you have to do it, there are some people that do it in different ways. So it's not always spoken words, sometimes that your life speaks more prophetically than what's going on your mouth. Because there are too many people that get to say, do this, do this, do this, and then go treat everybody else like there's nothing. So it's, it's a holistic kind of endeavor that I think is only something when God urges you to do something and protects you while you're walking through fiery furnace, where you're walking through the wolves, when you walk through the place with your friends that are talking behind your back, but you know you can't help but continue to speak so that everybody can. I'm done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> wow, is all I can say. Uh, I know that my fellow alum, my fellow colleagues, and all of those that are have joined in and are watching are sitting in awe and amazement of the nuggets and the wisdom that you ladies have dropped today. And I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you very, very, very much for being the ones to do it anyhow, for being the ones to sacrifice the relationships, for being the one to not be afraid of not having people not like you, for being the ones to stand up, for being the ones to stand out, for being the ones to use your voice, for being the ones to show up holistically, for being the ones to embrace all that God has created you for being. We thank you for being the ones. 
we thank you for even coming and just spending this time with us and allowing us just to glean just a little bit from you, just to learn a little bit of how we too can walk this journey and how we too can survive the genderism and the sexism and the classism and the racism and all the isms that we face, whether it is in ministry or outside in the world. We thank you for being those prophetic leaders. We thank you for walking in your office of being a prophet. We thank you for being a teacher. We thank you for being a professor. We thank you for being a healer and a pastoral care provider. We thank you. We thank you. I thank you. I know during the time that I was in seminary, I, I share the same experience as Dr. Grant, that it was not a great experience, but I thank you ladies, because each one of you played a role in getting me across that stage on May 11th of 2019. And I thank each of you for it. And so we will end because we are in our last four minutes. So I will give you all one minute. Um, there was a couple of questions that came in, so I'm going to combine them and I'm going to ask you all, um, often you hear the, the the statement that says, if you can say something to your younger self, but I want to shift that question just a little bit. And what is one nugget that you would give to those that are following behind you that they can take with them and carry as they are walking and unfolding and being molded and transformed into who God has created them to be? What is the one nugget that you would leave with the younger generation? And I don't mean age, but I mean the rising. Mm. One? Mm. Okay, mm. maybe two. <laughs> I, I'm going back to uh, Howard Thurman, The Sound of the Genuine. Uh, God knew who when God called us. And uh, we don't have to be anybody else. And we just have to be faithful to the call that God, whether it is a pastor or one who's a preacher who can write, be faithful to that and keep focused on that. And don't try to be anybody else. Be who you are. That's all I have. Thank you. Dr. Grant? There is a building on campus um, named after um, Dr. James Co James Coston, one of the presidents of IDC, and, and it's called the, the Coston Life Learning Building. I think that's the name on there, Life Learning Building. Um, I would say uh, to uh, the younger generation, and as you said, not necessarily chronologically, but uh, younger in ministry. Um, life is an educational experience. So never stop studying. Never stop growing. Never stop reading. Because life is our realities. We are forever growing. So education is a lifelong reality. Never stop learning. And Dr. McCrary? Trust. The foundation for teamwork, the foundation for growth and development, trust. Look for the trust in the self, but also look for the trust in your relationships. Self, others, God, trust. Work on it, cherish it. I would also say a little bit with Dr. Grant, never stop asking questions. Questions can save your life, literally. So ask your questions, 
find a way to get your ember, however, answers to questions. There are responses. For me, there has been more life in raising which lead to other questions. And then the awe in life is, oh, I never thought I would find that out by asking the question. Seek. Then you shall find knocking the door. Ask. And something will be given. Trust your question and trust your feelings because your feelings are sacred and your feelings give you entree sometimes to the words that formulate pursuant to what was really going on because your feelings gave you an indication and then you find the words to articulate those feelings to some extent. Trust your feelings. They're God given all of your feelings and explore them sacredly. Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Grant Collier, Reverend Dr. Uh, Carolyn Akua McCrary, we are eternally grateful for you all. This has been, an, as I've already said, an amazing experience, and we thank you again for being the genuine you. We thank you for trusting. We thank you for never stop asking questions. We thank you for your continuous study, your continuous learning, your continuous growth and development, and then your being like the San Coastal Bird and reaching back. Not only just to pick up, but to drop those seeds for others as well. So we turn this program now over to our President Dean, Dean John F. Green, who will come and bring greetings in his own way. To our alumni. President Dr. J. Hako and the officers of the Turner Theological Seminary Alumni Association, alumni and friends. I'm extremely overjoyed to join you on this occasion as we honor these three outstanding women for their leadership and contributions to the church and the academy. They all have been leaders of change and prophetic problem solvers achieving justice and equality for women in church and society. We are thankful for their intellectual scholarship and mentorship in shaping the lives and ministries of so many throughout the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So to these extraordinary women of African Methodism, Dr. Jacqueline Grant Collier, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Aku McCrary, and the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. Thank you for allowing us to sit at your feet tonight. We have been blessed and empowered by your stories, leadership, and ministries. To our alumni, thank you for your sharing tonight and your support throughout the year for Turner Theological Seminary. We appreciate all that you do and look forward to each of you joining us tomorrow as we celebrate our 127th Founders Observance. Good night, and in the words of the CBS anchor, Nora O'Donnell, stay positive and test negative. Greetings and Happy New Year as the President Dean of Turner Theological Seminary. I want to take this moment to invite our alumni and entire AME Church Connection 
to join us for a virtual celebration of the 127th Founders Observance of the Turner Theological Seminary, scheduled for February the 1st and 2nd. You will be blessed with impactful preaching and teaching by Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green, Sr., presiding prelate, 7th Episcopal no. District. This seminary is the intersection where race, religion, economics, politics, theology, history, language, culture, and the critical interrogation of what we think about God are brought together in a way that is both intersectional and utilitarian. And Reginald T. Jackson, presiding prelate of the 6th Episcopal District. The evangelical right also call themselves evangelical Christians. And my argument with them is I have no problem with you calling yourselves evangelical, but I have a problem with you calling yourselves Christian. Because my brother, my sisters, when you look at them, too many of them, they tell the king what the king wants to hear, not what the king needs to hear. The man and Dr. Dennis C. Dickerson, retired general officer, who will give our Henry McNeil Turner Heritage Lecture. I promise that you will be blessed and inspired by the preaching and teaching. So register today and thank you in advance for your support of Turner Theological Seminary 127th Founders Observance.